Good morning again. If you would please turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13 is our text this morning. Uh, so most of you remember the Dittman family, right? They recently moved. <laughs> you laugh at that? Yeah, that's, who could forget the Dittmans, right? Uh, they sat right over here around where the Pates sit. Okay, right, 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 right back there. Um, they recently moved to West Virginia just a couple of months ago. Um, and Robbie sent an email to us asking us to write a letter uh, to the new church that they're going to be placing membership at uh, to let the elders there know kind of who they are and what they're about and that kind of thing. Um, and so I wrote a very nice email letter thing to their new eldership saying, oh, we're going to miss them so much. They were great people. They were hardworking, wonderful people. The kind of family you build a church around. Okay, and that's the letter that I officially printed out, had all our elders sign, and we sent it off to their new elders. And then I wrote a second letter, because that's how I am, um, saying a lot of other things about Robbie and Miriam uh, and had all of our elders sign that letter. And then I sent that letter to Robbie, pretending like that was the letter that we actually sent to the church. Okay? He is going to miss me so much. All right. Um, I won't show you the whole thing, but here's a, a paragraph from what I wrote for the one that I sent just to Robbie. Okay? And that is, uh, Robbie sometimes can be disruptive in worship services and classes with verbal shouts from the seat or pew. He believes these unprompted verbal insertions are humorous, but he shows a lack of wisdom or discernment. You may have noticed that Robbie tends to lack a desire to attend services and gatherings in clothing appropriate for the setting. Numerous conversations and encouragements did not make a positive impact on his wardrobe choices. Perhaps you can be more successful in helping him through this sensitive and personal embarrassment. Okay. Here's how I ended it. Okay. Should you have any further questions for us or should you need to speak with us when you may be challenged by this couple, please do not hesitate to contact us. We are including all of our personal cell phone numbers and email addresses so that we can be available to you day or night as you enter into this new challenging season of your congregation's life. <laughs> We're praying for you, okay? Um, just so you know about your three elders, by the way, whenever I told them, I'm going to write a second letter, uh, Alan rolled his eyes, okay? Uh, David Palmer says, you guys don't have nearly enough work to do. You need more work to do, okay? And Randy said, ooh, I want to play. Send it to me. Let me contribute to it too, okay? <laughs> Which perfectly encapsulates those three guys. I love it. Okay. All right. Now, why would I do this? Okay, why would I send this letter to Robbie? All right, well, in the truest sense of the word, uh, I am treating him like the brother I never had. Okay? And that's what family does, right? We laugh together, we cry together, we go through all of life together. Uh, and I hope that as you're gathered here today, you really do feel like you are surrounded by your brothers and sisters. Okay, one of the things that's on the, the top of the bulletin every week, we say it every week from the pulpit, but we are a loving family. Okay, that's part of what it means to be here together today. Okay, there are numerous metaphors in Scripture for how we should view the church, uh, and one of the most common is that we see ourselves as a family, right? God is our Father, we are brothers and sisters, we are serving together in His kingdom as a family family. We laugh together, we cry together, sometimes we even fuss and fight together, and even that I'm okay with so long as we continue to come and gather around the same table as family. Okay? That's what we're doing. Now, uh, this week is Thanksgiving, and most of us will spend a large portion of the day Thursday sitting around a table with family. Now, some of us are really looking forward to that. Um, and some of us have certain family members that can make holidays a challenge. Okay? If you have sisters, you know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, and so I thought this week about doing a traditional Thanksgiving sermon. Um, I'm entering year five of my time with you guys, and so I've done five Thanksgiving sermons already. And what I've done every year so far is the traditional, we should be so thankful to God for all of our many blessings. Uh, but I thought I would do something a little bit differently this year. I thought we could continue in our study of 1 Corinthians 13, uh, and we will use this text to talk about how to survive spending time with our families, okay? Right, and the answer to that 
is that we need to be the most loving person that we can possibly be at that table. Okay, because if you go back and you look at what's going on in the church in Corinth when Paul writes this letter, a lot of it stems from the fact that they could not sit around the table as brothers and sisters and get along with each other. Okay, so Paul was writing them, reminding them of things, of the centrality of sitting around a table as brothers and sisters, and what does it look like to be able to do that in a way that is loving towards each other and honoring towards God Almighty? Okay, I don't think there's anything more appropriate for us to talk about the week of Thanksgiving than this. Okay, and so we've gotten in our study now to chapter 13, where Paul says, if you really want to be the people that God has called you to be, if you want to do this Christian thing and do it right, then it starts by having this attitude of pure agape love. Okay, so for us, do we want to thrive during this holiday season? Then we need to take an extra dose of agape love. All right, so notice our text this morning. This is the, the second part of chapter 13. It says, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. All right, if you were here last week, we talked about the first three verses of this. Uh, in verses one through three, Paul says, love is more important than everything else. I don't care how talented you are. I don't care how many different skills you possess or how many gifts you have in other areas. None of it matters without love. Okay, now we get to verses four through seven, uh, where he will describe love itself. He'll give us this definition by telling us all of these different things that love is. Can you note this is challenging language? Right, we're going to break this down. We're not going to cover every single word that Paul uses. But basically, we could sum all of this up with the last song that we sang, which is, you should be more like Jesus. Okay, Jesus perfectly personified all of these different characteristics of what it means to have true agape love. Okay, do you really want to know how to be a more loving person? Spend more time studying and following the life of Jesus. All right, so uh, as we study some specific words in our text, I want us to ask ourselves three questions. Okay, and the first one is, how do we see this kind of agape love in Jesus? Right, when we read this characteristic, where do we see in the Gospels how Jesus does this? Okay, second question, uh, how do we see this, or unfortunately, how do we often not see this in ourselves? Okay, what would it look like if we would love more like Jesus loved? Okay, and so that's question number three. What would it look like if we could grow in this? If we could become more like Jesus in this aspect of love, how would that change our interactions with each other? How would that change our lives? How would that make things better for us and everybody around us? Fair enough? Okay. Uh, so the first word on our list, uh, which my wife is practicing right now, uh, is patience. Okay. Agape love is patient. Okay, this Greek word that Paul uses here literally means long-suffering. Okay, we tend to think of patience uh, as the quality that you need when you're going to the grocery store and you get in line and then the lady in front of you pulls out her checkbook, right? And you think, I didn't know they even did that at grocery stores anymore, right? And you need patience. Okay, and that's true as far as it goes, but the word that Paul uses here means much more than that. This is not just about waiting, Okay, the question here is, how much personal pain are we willing to take on for the sake of other people? Um, you ever done the thing before where you're holding a baby and you're trying to get the baby to fall asleep? Some of you as older parents remember back when you had a little baby or maybe you have a grandbaby. Okay, and you rock that baby, you finally get that baby to sleep. And about the same time that baby falls to sleep, your arm falls asleep. Okay? And now you've got a choice to make, right? Am I going to wake up the baby or am I going to just put up with the pain in my arm and let the baby sleep, right? And most of us who've been sleep deprived before know what it's like. You put up with the pain yourself. Why? Because you love your kid more than you love yourself. You willingly take on an extra dose of suffering because of love, right? What does it look like for us to love each other that way? Uh, you remember the story at the end of the Gospel of John where Jesus reinstates Peter? Okay, and he asks him, he says, so Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He says, no, 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 Peter, 
do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. He says, no, Peter, do you love me? Okay, and he asks him three times, and three times Peter has to say, yes, Lord, I love you. And that number three is extremely significant because just a few pages earlier, we read about how Jesus was denied by Peter three times, right? And all that pain comes right back into that conversation. And yet, in that conversation between Jesus and Peter, Jesus is reinstating Peter. He's basically handing the keys to the kingdom over to Peter and says, I'm leaving, and I'm leaving all of this in your hands, Okay? And I can't think of anything better in the Gospels of how much patience Jesus showed than the patience he continually showed with these young men who followed him around. Jesus put up with a lot of personal pain. He put up with a lot of personal suffering for the sake of those that he loved. Okay, so, how patient was Jesus with everybody that he met? Okay, how patient has Jesus been with you and me? In light of that, how much patience do I tend to display towards other people when they don't do things the way I think they ought to do them? I'm not just not me, like y'all too, okay? Do you know what love is? It's patient. Uh, We should try to remember that in case you have a brother-in-law who likes to drone on and on about some engineering story that nobody wants to hear at the Thanksgiving table on Thursday hypothetically, right? What is it like for us to love in patience? All right, number next. Uh, He talks about kindness, okay? And I define kindness as giving people what they need as they need it. Okay, here's another story from the Gospel of John. This one's from chapter two. Uh, Jesus goes into the temple, and when he goes to the temple, he sees that the Jews have turned the court of the Gentiles, right, which is the first court you go into when you go into the temple, which is as far as the Gentiles could go, right, and then after you go through the court of the Gentiles, then you get into the court of the Jews themselves, and that's where everyone went to go pray and do their worship, right? But out in the court of the Gentiles, the Jews didn't care if the Gentiles could worship or not, so they turned the court of the Gentiles into a market, That's where you could buy animals, that's where you could sell stuff, that's where you could change your money. And Jesus walks in and sees this place that's supposed to be a sacred place set aside for prayer is now a carnival. So, when Jesus sees this, does he walk over and calmly ask them, hey guys, if you could take this outside, I'd really appreciate it. Is that what Jesus does? No. He makes a whip out of cords, throws tables over, and drives them out. Why? Why? Why in the world would I tell that story when I'm talking about kindness? Okay, I think too often we confuse kindness with niceness. Okay, was Jesus always kind? Yes. Okay, does that mean he avoided all conflict and never upset anybody? Yeah, not even close. Okay, now, uh, I'm not recommending to anyone that you go into your mother's house on Thanksgiving and turn over her kitchen table. That's... Not the point I'm trying to make this morning. I think kindness, loving people with kindness, is about giving people what they need as they need it. Okay, have there ever been times in your life when you've needed gentleness and encouragement? Have there been other times in your life where really you needed a kick in the pants? Right? Have there been times in your life where you just needed to be left alone? Have there been times in your life where you needed someone to pursue you when you thought you wanted to be left alone, but you didn't really want to be left alone? That made more sense than you think it did, right? Love showing itself in kindness gives people what they need as they need it. Now, this obviously requires wisdom and discernment. This requires a lot of empathy. It requires thinking about the other person's needs first, right? Kindness and niceness are not the same thing. Do I love people enough to give them what they need as they need it? All right, number next. Envy. Uh, Envy is about making comparisons where I come out on the short end, right? Paul says love doesn't do that, okay? In other words, I see someone else has a nicer car, a nicer house than I do, and I feel envious, okay? Um, I will pair with that boasting, Okay, boasting is making comparisons where I come out on the long end, right? Um, I brag and feel better about myself. I compare myself to somebody else and I feel better, okay? Like I look at the way Randy's dressed, I look at the way I'm dressed, I feel better about myself, right? That's boasting. It's making a comparison. 
Okay, I think Paul very intentionally puts these two things together in our text because if I'm really loving, then I don't need to compare myself with you positively or negatively, right? If I'm comparing myself with you to make myself feel better about myself or feel worse about myself, neither one of those things is true love. Okay, the reason our scripture reading this morning was from Luke chapter 18 is because I think that was the big problem that Jesus is addressing with that parable right? The Pharisee goes up to the temple to pray. He looks at the tax collector and he says, I'm better than he is. Now here's my prayer to God, okay? The tax collector looks at the Pharisee. He doesn't compare himself to the Pharisee. He looks straight up to heaven and he addresses the one who actually matters, right? So here's the thing. If I'm looking up to people or down to people, I'm missing where I'm supposed to be looking, okay? Where am I supposed to be looking? I'm supposed to be looking straight up to heaven. Okay, the only comparison that really matters is how does my life compare to Jesus and how am I getting more like him every day? Okay, love is not envy. It does not boast. Now, uh, this tends to be more applicable when we get around our family than we would sometimes like to admit. Okay, don't show me your hands, but how many of you are uneasy about seeing a sibling or an in-law Uh, Because you know that they're going to tell you about how everything in their life is fantastic. And you just can't help but compare yourself to them. Maybe your sister has been more successful than you are, right? She loves to rub it in your face when you get around that table. Or, uh, on the other end, maybe some of us will leave our Thanksgiving table and go, can you believe that she's doing this with her life? Why, I would never. Bless her heart. What are we doing in that? Are we loving? No, we are comparing ourselves to others because instead of being fully loving, I'm still caught up on me. Okay, both envy and boasting at their heart still keep the focus on us, whereas love knows how to keep the focus on the other. Does that work? Love does not envy, it does not boast. All right. Uh, he also says love is not rude. Okay, and this is a difficult word for us. Uh, Because there's not a perfect English equivalent. Uh, But basically, rude is something that's unpresentable, right? Or some part that would lead to shame. Now, I think all of us have stories that we would rather not tell our mother or our grandmother as we're sitting at the Thanksgiving table. How many of us have stories that we'd rather not have to get up here this morning and share with everybody else? Three of you have stories. Okay, the rest of you are complete. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. Another story of Jesus. In John chapter 8, the Pharisees brought before Jesus a woman who had been caught in adultery. And they said, Rabbi, this woman's been caught in adultery. The law says that we stone such people. So we're ready to stone her. And Jesus says, okay, any of you here who don't have your own story of shame... Any of you here who can claim to be perfect, any of you who claim that there's nothing wrong in your life, feel free to pick up a rock and stone her. Of course, quite famously, they all slowly walk away because they realize that they are as unpresentable as she is. And of course, the reason Jesus tells this story uh, is not to justify adultery. Uh, His point is that all of us have parts of our lives that are unpresentable. And yet we realize that if we lived in lives that were completely loving, um, we wouldn't have those parts, right? Uh, Love doesn't give in to those things. Um, Love lives in such a way that even if I were to show a video of your full last week and everything that you did, you wouldn't be embarrassed for me to show it in church, right? What is it like for us to love in a way that is never rude? All right, Uh, number next. He says that love keeps no record of wrongs. Now, this is an accounting term. Uh, Literally, the person who keeps the records is the accountant who keeps the the debits and the credits and the ledger. Uh, And Jesus says, you know, if we truly love, then when we deal with other people, we don't keep a record. And this is hard for us because I like to keep records, right? I need to know what you've done wrong to me so that I know how to treat you better in the future, I need to know what grudges I need to hold on to and who's been nice to me this week and who hasn't and how I can sort all that out, right? Of course, the problem with that is then we let sins from the past continue to influence us when we should have let them go a long, long time ago. So, 
before you sit down this week at a Thanksgiving table, this is kind of hurtful, right? Uh, What is it you need to let go of? Who is it in your family that you need to forgive for something? What past sin are you going to carry with you to that Thanksgiving table that you should have left behind you a long time ago? What wrong has been done to you? Okay? And this isn't saying that, oh, everything's fine and just completely okay, right? Um, it's saying that I'm going to choose not to hang on to it anymore. Okay? What wrong do we need to let go of as we gather around a table with our brothers and sisters this week? Fair enough? All right. And finally, uh, verse 7, the very end of this section, Paul says, Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Now, I contend that it is easy to love for a short period of time. Take any man uh, on his first date. How much effort does he put into that date? Yeah, He'll shower, he'll put on cologne, he'll open the door for her, he'll take her anywhere she wants to go. Oh, you want to order two entrees? Please do. Oh, dessert? Yeah, absolutely. Anywhere you want to go, anything you want to do, right? He will do everything he can for that woman on the first date. Okay. Um, after they get married, go forward about a year and a half or so, uh, is he still opening the door for her? This is not about us, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> Is he still going to take her wherever she wants to go? Is he still going to let her order whatever she wants? Right? Okay. Now, is the true measure of love the way he treats her on the first date or the way he treats her years in the marriage? Right? Okay, because love is something that we can fake for a while. Right? Love is something that we can act like towards new people that we meet. We can do it for a little bit of time. Uh, The mark of true love, though, is that it's an always kind of love. It's the kind of love that we'll keep practicing years down the road in our relationships with each other. Okay? Again, it's easy for us to, to look really pretty when we're here for an hour a week on Sunday, but are we truly loving each other throughout the week? Are we really loving each other when it gets hard? What does it look like for us to do that always kind of love? And again, if we want to see a good example of this, all we have to do is look to the life of Jesus Christ. Does Jesus love you when you're doing good? Absolutely. Um, Does he love us even on our worst days? Absolutely. So how should we treat each other? Same kind of way. All right, I hope that as we um, go through this week, as we go through this whole season, really as we go through our entire lives, that we will continue to practice these things of love, that we will continue to think, what are the ways in which I need to grow more like Christ's love and how I treat other people around me? Uh, At this time in our service, though, we're going to sing a few verses of an invitation song. Uh, During the singing of this song, I will be down front. One of our shepherds will be down front. Uh, During this song, this is a time where we as the church want to be here for you, for whatever it is you're going on with in your life. Uh, Before we sing that, though, I'd like to close us with a word of blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you and give you peace. Let's stand and sing.